All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, hanging out late here. I know this is the last session before the, uh, the aquarium, right? That should be pretty fun. I'm looking forward to that. Um, so my name is Randy Abernathy. This is Choosing the Right Technology for Your API, and we've got a lot of fun stuff to take a look at. As I was just kind of mentioning a sec ago, um, this is a tutorial, so there's a lots of hands on here, and this thing is packed. So I'm going to go through stuff. You're probably going to have to pick and choose which you know, labs you want to try and things that you want to experiment with. We're going to cover a lot of material and uh, try to get to everything that's in the, in the roster here as we move forward. Um, I work with a company called RxM. We're a cloud native training and consulting shop. Been involved with um, API kind of stuff for quite a while. Um, really got enamored with Apache Thrift um, probably, I don't know, a good 10 years ago, maybe, maybe longer and have been involved with that project, but super big fan of technology in this space in general. And so what we're going to do to kind of um, work our way through this, we're going to talk about the big picture API background, you know, kind of what do you need out of an API, what are some of the traits of a, of a good API. Um, then we'll take a look at a bunch of representative technologies. There's other stuff that you might run across when it comes to building APIs either for the internet or microservices internally in the, in the back end. But this is a pretty good lineup of the things that you might see. I, I would say, you know, probably covering a good, you know, somewhere between 50 and 90% of the, the technologies that you probably would actively run into in commercial use, at least um, presently. And there's, there's some legacy stuff out there as well. But we'll, we'll start off with number one and work our way down as, as far as we get. And uh, when the bell rings, we'll We'll call it a day. But there's lots of fun stuff here. All of the slides are up on Sketch, as I mentioned. Um, there's the links on this page as well. And the, the labs are, are there as well, also on Sketch. So you can pull them down either way. The one thing I will reiterate is that if you, if you use that link, instead of just pulling it off a of Sketch, there's a markdown also in that bucket. So all you have to do is just change the PDF extension of the URL that comes up for the lab to .md. And that'll give you a markdown version of the lab. So you could open that up in you know, your favorite editor and copy and paste, where if you copy multiple lines out of the PDF lab stuff, it's, you're going to get weird hidden characters in your editor, and it's not going to work. So um, something, to, something to think about. All right, so let's, um, let's jump in. We are on the clock. Um, short history of API tech. There are a lot of different, you know, API sort of um, initiatives that have happened over the years. But it's really kind of interesting. We still use RPC today, and it was probably one of the first API technologies that was really conceived. So 1980, um, you know, Bruce J. Nelson sort of coined that term um, in early ARPANET. Um, Xerox came out with a commercial product probably shortly thereafter, and then Sun RPC. In 1984, Sun RPC was created. We are still using that dang stuff today. If you have any kind of NFS going on or you know, other types of things, Sun RPCs under the covers there. Um, then we sort of got into this whole uh, enamored with objects sort of um, scenario where everybody wanted to do everything with objects. And then we thought, hey, since objects are so cool inside these big monolithic pieces of software that we're running, maybe it would be neat if we access them remotely. And then we realized that really wasn't actually very neat at all. It didn't scale very good. And that kind of went the way of the dodo. Um, and then the whole service-oriented architecture thing came along. And we started thinking, hey, gee, you know, breaking up bigger applications into services, granted maybe bigger ones than we use today, is, is probably a good idea architecturally as computers become more kind of commodity clusters of systems, you know, the internet and all that sort of stuff. And so um, SOAP came along to help us there. And then you know, we, we realized that maybe SOAP, trying to take the RPC idea and plant it on top of an HTTP-based world, didn't seem to work super great, and we moved on to REST. And so REST is you know, probably the oldest of the technologies that's still in you know, very, very heavy use today. Um, and it stands the test of time because it was designed for the world that we are in. And it's one of the... Um, the best API technologies that you could select for operating over the internet because it leverages the infrastructure of the World Wide Web. Every company that has a reverse proxy or a proxy or whatever that's caching your stuff, you're getting that for free. They're paying for all that infrastructure and that memory and the caching and the things that make your application faster. Not you, you're just hosting the back end piece. And so there's a lot of really wonderful things about building RESTful APIs. 
Um, the next thing that you start seeing is people want to do this same kind of API sort of stuff in their back end where they're starting to have lots more services communicating with each other. And so this, this stuff needs to happen a lot faster. And so they need something that's not uh, maybe as text oriented, something that's binary, something that can serialize and deserialize really quickly, something that's maybe got a little bit more aggressive API contract kind of uh, approach associated with it. And so we get protocol buffers. That's internal at Google, protocol buffers. And so um, shortly thereafter, uh, you know, at that, in that era, you know, Facebook would look for smart people from Google and hire them you know, to get the technologies that they wanted. Like, hey, that's a pretty good idea. Hire a couple of guys, and you get a Facebook thrift. And so thrift was developed as Facebook. Facebook open sourced it right away, though, and it became Apache thrift. Shortly thereafter, protocol buffers got open source because they're like, hey, you know, this looks a lot like, and next thing you know, protocol buffers is out. Um, and then Apache Avro shows up shortly thereafter. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we uh, introduce Kafka here at the end. WebSocket shows up to provide a way to sort of give us a better streaming experience in the World Wide Web. And then shortly thereafter, we end up with some HTML5 stuff and server sent events. And we then get into this cloud native era. Um, this, the whole idea of gRPC was really predicated on HTTP2, so those sort of you know, came out hand in hand. HTTP2 shows up in 2015. gRPC comes out more or less depending on HTTP2. Now, could you implement it over something else? Sure, does anybody know? Um, so it's really a modern RPC system that really leverages the benefits of HTTP2 and sort of needs those benefits too. It doesn't work on HTTP11. Um, and then Google donates uh, gRPC to the CNCF. Um, GraphQL Foundation is established. Uh, around 2012, Facebook um, created that and then open sourced it 2015, established an open source foundation as a new home for it in 2019. And that's another um, sort of popular initiative. So you can kind of see the, you know, the remote procedure call, object uh, invocation, resource-oriented um, types of approaches, streaming, and then we're down here with the graph stuff and, and artificial intelligence where we're getting more into like a query kind of scenario um, where we want to ask questions that are a little bit more open-ended and flexible. So the world's changing and there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, but the idea here is for us to kind of take a look at the technologies that are out there and you know, compare and contrast them a little bit. So there's a lot of things that you could say about APIs that are pros and cons and things like that. But these are some of the big bullet points that we think about as engineers when we're looking at a, a piece of technology for an API. The first thing um, is headers. We need to be able to communicate with the platform sort of out of band from the application communications. And so we have to have this sort of key value pair mechanism for doing things like telling the cache stuff what to do with stuff, um, doing things like providing credentials, authentication, and so on. All right, the application developer really doesn't want to mess with all that stuff. They just want that to work, and they want their application to do its thing. And so the payload is the application piece, and the headers you know, take care of that stuff. If, if you don't have headers, supported in your, in your API technology, a lot of people are just going to turn their nose up and look for something else, because it's pretty fundamental these days um, for things to work right. Next, um, polyglot. Uh, the days of everything just works in C are over, of course, and, and the days of everything just works in Java are over, and we're in a world where there's all sorts of languages. You know, and many, many organizations um, use multiple languages all day long, and we need to make sure that services can communicate. So they've got to be polyglot. Um, robust in interface definition language. Contracts are at the heart of all of this, and when you're, when you're building big systems, these contracts that describe what this service is going to do and the kinds of things that you can pass in and out of it are really, really important. They're foundational to the way that you architect your system. Um, Last large project I worked on, when we would hire a new engineer, we would give them our interface definition language and let them look at that without looking at any of the implementation. And they would come up to speed on what was going on in our platform and understand it so much faster and so much better without the implementation details, just looking at that IDL. Now, the IDL we were using back then was uh, uh, MSRPC you know, kind of IDL, and it had a lot of issues, and one of the biggest issues was it didn't evolve. If you needed to change something, you broke the world. You had to recompile everything because there were all these UUIDs flying around, and oh, hey, that's not the right interface. Well, this is one 
extra function in the, no, sorry, it's not the right interface. So with evolution, we need to have the ability to add parameters you know, to, to functions that already exist. We need to have the ability to add functions to services. We need to have the ability to pass new things back that we weren't passing back before. And clients who get stuff that they don't know what it is, they should just ignore it. And that's you know, kind of how we've gotten used to using JSON. And um, it has propagated into all of the more popular modern interface technologies. Streaming is another pretty killer feature. There, when you're a client and you're communicating with a server, you can send it stuff whenever you want to. You can make a call whenever you like. But the server is not allowed to respond to you in a lot of environments until you actually make a call to it. So we have to do all sorts of weird monkey business like polling and, and, and whatnot, and that's not very efficient and um, can cause problems. So streaming is a big piece of the puzzle. And I always thought this was the killer feature of gRPC, the fact that you could make regular requests from the client, but then you could also set up streams that would come back to you on an event-driven basis, and that's magic right there. And that's, that's one of the reasons why gRPC is driving so much of you know, we're in the cloud open track here with you know, Kubernetes using gRPC everywhere. Docker uses gRPC to talk to ContainerD, and you know, the, the list goes on. It's a really, really popular technology for this space. And then broad adoption, um, obviously you need to have support, good documentation, things like that. And then speed is really important too for a lot of things. So what we'll do is we'll flip through a bunch of technologies and we'll take a look at how they rate in these things. These are my ratings, um, and I'm just going to give them a, you know, doesn't really address it, not bad or good, you know, kind of a rating. Um, and we'll kind of see how they compare. Now, this is a, a pattern I just throw up super fast because it's the curiously recurring communications pattern, as we, uh, we call it at RxM. And we see it a lot. It's curiously recurring. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot like the CRTP pattern in C++ if you're... Uh, uh, an older geek, you might recall that. Um, but um, the, the idea here is that we see a lot of systems built like this where REST is used in the outside world because it's super well understood. Anybody can digest it really fast and easy. They can understand your APIs quickly because it's universal. Everybody's got good tooling for it. And it leverages the infrastructure of the internet that's already out there that you just get for free. But when you go into the back end, you don't have web servers and proxies and reverse proxies and all this other stuff. You've got a network and a bunch of computers. And so if you want the back end pieces to communicate really quick, there are maybe other technologies you could look at, and this is where RPC shows up. You know, all the big guys, you know, Google, Protobuf, and Stubby, which they'll ultimately you get gRPC out of, um, Apache Thrift from the Facebook people, uh, Twitter created Finagle based on uh, Thrift, and you know, there are lots of other RPC systems out there in use, um, making the backend systems faster, and also giving them very robust contractual APIs, maybe a little bit more so than you might have in the more Wild Westy kind of REST world. And then there are also parts of systems that just need to be really decoupled, where we need asynchronous kinds of interactions and queuing so that you know, lifespans can be different and uh, performance requirements can be different. We need that impedance you know, uh, adjuster. And that's where you see things like Kafka or NATS or stuff like that, messaging and loose coupled systems and, and all that. But those have APIs too, make no mistake. You can't put a message in a thing and then have somebody else pull it out and not know what it is and have that be super valuable, right? There's got to be some sort of schema or something like that associated with those things. And all of these technologies are wired into this whole idea of a schema. Whether the schema has functions that you call or just messages doesn't you know, really make a big difference. Last thing I would mention is that the cloud native approach and you know, microservice-oriented container package dynamically orchestrated, as it used to be known, has driven a lot of interest in APIs and people over, you know, building so many services that that becomes a real um, piece of the puzzle as well. All right, so with that said, I think we're ready to start jumping into some of the different example technologies. Um, I'm already atrociously behind my little schedule here, but I'm going to try to, try to speed up a little bit, but still uh, hit the important points. So HTTP, JSON, REST, um, obviously representational state transfer has some, um, some specific constraints associated with it. These are the six, right? Client server, that's pretty simple. The client calls the server, not the other way around. And so if the client calls the server and wants to set up a stream of data flowing back, 
that's not necessarily REST. Um, but it is really useful, and so that's exactly what gRPC brings to the table. Um, and some of these other technologies like um, server sent events and, and WebSocket. And so when people need to stream data, let's say you're building a trading application, I want to buy um, IBM. Great, that's a client server request, but now how do I give you status and market data and stream stuff back to you, right? It's, REST doesn't work very well that way. There's long polling and other weird stuff you can do, chunk. You know, it, it's not really built for that. Um, but it is stateless. And I think this is one of the most monumental things that was delivered to the distributed computing world here, hammering home the, the, the scalability that comes from not storing client state on the server. The client is quite capable of storing its own state. If you have 100 clients, you've got 100 little memories and CPUs to use for keeping track of their own auth tokens and their own, you know, what page I'm on and all that stuff. That's their business. That's not your server's business. And if it starts becoming your server's business, your server has identity. And if your server has identity, it's not a microservice. It's not easy to scale and all sorts of weird problems happen and you start creating cache arrays and weird stuff that slows everything down and makes it really complicated. So REST, stateless, services are really, that's, a, that's, a, that's something you can adopt anywhere and really get benefits from. Cacheable, right? This is the World Wide Web, right? There's caches all over the place, and if you can say, hey, somebody's getting something, and let's say I'm, I'm, you're, you're getting a product from a store, how often do you update your products, right? Let that thing live in the cache for two weeks or something. And then, you know, at checkout, if the price has changed, you can tell them or something. Um, you know, there's lots of, uh, lots of stuff around the cap theorem and thinking through how we can make things faster by relaxing some of our, you know, engineering tendencies to white knuckle everything into perfection, right? Um, speed is a, is, a, is a trait. It is a valuable thing for customers and caches are really, really important. If you turned off all the caches on your laptop, you would not be able to stand to use it. Right? Caches are indispensable in everything that we do. So caching, huge piece of the puzzle. Layered system, that's those headers we were talking about, right? Talking to all the layers, whether you're talking to the cache or the, you know, the, some, some sort of authentication component or, or what have you. And then um, code on demand, this is, you know, obviously you can pull in JavaScript and that's not you know, super relevant, but um, then uniform interface. Another really interesting design trait of some really RESTful APIs. This is the place where REST gets deep into the, you know, geeking out on the, the actual API technology, the essence of it, hypertext as the engine of application state and all that stuff. But, um, you know, the top things really bear a lot of value. And even if you're just doing straight ahead, you know, JSON over HTTP, those top things are, are, are super useful. So what does REST bring to the table? Support for headers. Um, it's super polyglot. It, it doesn't come with IDL, right? There's no implicit IDL, but there are a lot of IDLs out there. We'll look at OpenAPI in a second, and so you can pick one if you want to. Um, support for change, absolutely, super flexible. Streaming, not really. Um, broad adoption, the broadest. Um, speed, over the internet, might be one of the best things you could pick. Might faster than RPC in many cases, right? You can't cache RPC that drills all the way to the back end every time. Um, and then finally, optionality. The ability to do queries, um, mm, sort of, you know, but not really. Not, not super designed for it. So how do we get a contract if we want to, right? It's sort of like, for, for me, I'm not gonna use anything that doesn't have the ability to describe a robust contract between me and my internal customers or my external customers or whatever. Well, we have RAML, API Blueprint, um, the, uh, the Open API Initiative, which is what you know, most of the stuff in our space here with Kubernetes and what have you is adopted. So it used to be Swagger. And so you can describe objects, as you can see over there on the right. And then you can describe interfaces, um, RESTful style interfaces, different operations that you can perform on, on routes and stuff like that. And um, very, very, very powerful and very expressive. All right, so there is a lab here. This is the interface I'm guessing most everybody is already pretty familiar with, so we're not gonna stop for this one, but it is in there. It's step one in the lab, and it has you um, build a simple client, build a simple server, see how they work together. I think actually I use curl too. And then it has you create an open API description of the API that you just built, generate the client stubs, and then create a client 
that uses them. So, and a lot of the lab stuff, the lab stuff's self-explanatory. You can do it on any system that has Docker installed, because the only command you actually type on your laptop is Docker something, right? Everything else is in a container which you dispose of in the cleanup step at the end. So, um, very easy to do these labs at a later point in time. So, Apache Thrift. Let's talk about Apache Thrift. Um, it, you know, a full disclosure, I already told you I'm on the PMC of Apache Thrift, so do I, I, I kind of like Apache Thrift. I'm a big fan. Um, what I love about Apache Thrift is the IDL. The language is so expressive, the IDL. I, I think it's the most expressive IDL. Um, the reason that um, I would steer folks towards gRPC would be is if you need some sort of streaming. I mean, that's a killer feature. Thrift doesn't have any kind of real implementation of that um, that is uh, anywhere like what gRPC has. However, the thing that I do love about Thrift is it has um, collections like list, map, set. Um, all the programming languages we're going to work with can, you know, can directly implement those things, so why not, right? Instead of repeating something and you know, creating uh, sort of a lower level implementation, we have a higher level implementation. We can more directly represent certain types of data structures, and I really like that a lot. You have constants, collections, services, exceptions, all of that sort of stuff can be defined in Apache Thrift IDL. And when you have RPC, one of the things I want to talk about, this is just RPC in general, not Thrift specifically. If you have an RPC system and you have a monolith that you're trying to decompose, it's really nice to do it with RPC rather than REST because REST is resource oriented, right? You, you create resources and you define operations on them where if you've got you know, packages and classes and things like that inside your monolith, they have functions that they call, right? And it's a lot easier to just to say, take these five functions this thing has and expose them over the internet. And you can do it as simply as taking the code and dropping it into a pre-built server, which all the RPC systems have RPC hosts that you can just use. And then you describe the interface in IDL, and then you generate the stubs. You generate the stubs on the server side for your server, and you generate the stubs on the client side for whatever programming language the clients are using. And since they're polyglot, you know, Apache Thrift, gRPC, what have you, with Protoc, you're going to be able to generate stubs for pretty much anything you need, um, anything that's commercially viable anyway. So another you know, great use for um, RPC. One last thing I would say about RPC is it's fast. It's, is it faster over the internet? Maybe not, right? If you can get something out of the browser's cache instead of going all the way back to the back end to get it, that's going to be faster. And that's what REST will bring to you on the internet. But in a back end system where everything's just services talking to services over the wire, it's a lot faster. Here's an example of SOAP on the left. That's one million calls from a client to a server over localhost on a given laptop. Then you have REST. These are all the, stabilizing the technologies as much as possible, changing one at a time, right? So this is SOAP, JAX-WS in Java, both the server and the client in Java. Yeah, I got to pick a language, right? They're all going to be a little different, but you know that's Java. Tomcat 7, HTTP XML with SOAP. You move to REST, and it's still Tomcat 7, HTTP, but it goes to JSON, and you're using JAX-RS, and it's quite a bit faster. One of the things about REST is GET requests typically don't even have a body. So there's no serialization, deserialization on the call, only on the response, right? So that's pretty nice. Um, when you move over to Apache Thrift, still using JSON, still using Tomcat 7, still using HTTP, it's half the time to run a million requests that SOAP is and quite a bit faster than REST. And here's the real rub, right? As soon as you get rid of that application server and you just run one of the RPC servers that comes with Thrift or gRPC or whatever your choice is, you're going to be down in this zone, right? Orders of magnitude faster. Not order, orders of magnitude faster. And if, when you get down to the compact protocol, the compact protocol in Apache Thrift was basically designed to use the exact same integer compression, you know, fast serialization technique that Protobuf uses. So, you know, Protobuf is a, the, the, the fastest you're going to get gRPC is a little bit slower than Thrift over there because that's on raw TCP, right? And gRPC's always got HTTP2 underneath it. But same general neighborhood, right? So this is what we're looking at. It's a big difference. And you think about network utilization, CPU, memory, latency adds up. When you have microservices, you're not calling one guy that does a bunch of, you know, stack pointer adjustments and then responds to you. You're making network requests five or six times before you get the answer 
to the client. I think Netflix said their average request was handled by five to seven microservices. So that's five to seven network calls. Network calls, you know, you're talking about context switches and all this overhead just to get that one request, that speed makes a big difference, right? Five to six of those or five to six of those, right? So performance, big driver for people looking at RPC. Decomposing monoliths, another big driver. It's a lot closer, you know, kind of a technology match. So Apache Thrift. Headers, yeah, more recent, uh, you know, a lot of uh, boots from the outside world. And finally, you know, the community got some stuff together. There's always a shortage of developers, so uh, uh, patches, you know, uh, welcome. Cross-platform support, absolutely. IDL, I think it's the best. Um, support for change, absolutely. You can, you can add methods to interfaces without breaking old clients. You can add parameters to functions without breaking old clients, and so on and so forth. Um, streaming, nope. Broad adoption. Not bad. Uh, it's, it was baked into a lot of things in the Apache ecosystem. You know, if you're an Apache project, you're supposed to pick other Apache projects unless there's a really good reason not to. Uh, people often find a really good reason to pick whatever they want, but you, you get the idea. Um, speed, thrift, maybe the fastest, right? Because you can really get down and just use TCP and nothing else. And then optionality, not really, but you, know, you can kind of fudge it if you needed to. Um, all right, so then there's a lab on building an Apache Thrift client and server. You get a chance to play around with the uh, API or uh, IDL for Apache Thrift. And that brings us to WebSocket. Going to cover this one pretty quick. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, are, who have invested in WebSocket are still going to stick with it, but a lot of people who are looking at you know, what they should adopt are probably going to look at server sent events or something like that. So we'll mention that as, as a, a, a sort of a comparison coming up. So the WebSocket API, basically, um, you, you use HTTP as sort of a bootstrap mechanism. So you get all the authentication, the TLS, all that good stuff that you would get with the header-based you know, kind of HTTP world. Then you upgrade, and you basically take that entire connection and convert it to WebSocket. And the great thing is that you're sending frames back and forth on an event basis. The client and the server can send frames to the other party whenever they feel like it. So it's, it's super nice from that standpoint. The, um, it's, it's, it's got a, a small amount of overhead. There's a, there's a frame header, so it's a little bit more than just raw TCP, but it, it gives you some, some great benefits, right? TLS, right? WSS is going to give you a secure WebSocket connection with T HTTPS under the covers at first, and, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, um, there's no headers anymore, right? Because you're now just sending frames back and forth. Um, it is sort of polyglot. I mean, there's a decent number of languages, but it's you know it's a pretty much a JavaScripty sort of thing because you're talking to a browser. Um, there's no IDL. You have to decide what you're going to put in there. So you could use something like JSON or Avro and use JSON schema or Avro or what have you. Um, evolution again, you know, it's just it doesn't address those things. You have to bring other technology. Um, reactive events and streaming, sure, it's great for that. Broad adoption, you know, pretty, pretty well adopted in some spaces, very fast, and doesn't have any sort of specific addressing of queries. All right, so that's uh, WebSocket. Really was relief for old HTTP systems that needed some sort of streaming to the client. So that next step in the lab is um, WebSocket stuff. And uh, we, we kind of elided that because um, just time, you know, trying to fit all this into 90 minutes, much less 45, didn't work. So that one's uh, removed. Server sent events is in the lab, and it's because this is the choice that a lot of people make going forward. Um, it is a easy way to send events um, to a client. The client can subscribe to these events, and if you're using HTTP2, you can have multiple event streams coming over the same TCP connection because HTTP2 can multiplex, you know, regular REST, you know, get, put, post stuff along with all your event streams, and you can have multiple event streams, and it's a single TCP connection. Now, you do have head align blocking problems at the TCP level, right? If you've got seven packets stacked up and packet number one didn't get delivered for some reason, you can't process the other ones until you get packet number one, you know, resent to you. So the, 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 the works can get gummed up at the TCP level, though they no longer get gummed up at the HTTP level, because HTTP2 fixes that. Um, but you know, 
when you, if you move to HTTP3, which is you know, something that's uh, getting closer, um, then that solves that problem as well. So this is a, this is a really great answer. The one, there's a few weird things. In the browser, the, the messages, the payload, the body of your events are always strings. So if you wanted to stream like video or audio or something, back to WebSockets. But for just about everything else, if you can get away with JSON, then this is probably your friend. Um, great technology, and the lab will walk you through setting up a really simple um, server and client example. So what does this bring to the table? Um, support for headers, it's HTTP based. Um, Cross-platform support, pretty much, but again, it's really Java scripty kind of centric. Um, so the, the languages that commonly support and work with that are certainly supported and you know, well supported and good, good documentation. Um, no real IDL again. Um, if you look at like open API, you'll see tickets that have been open for like six or seven years. Like, shouldn't we, you know, address server sent events? You know, yeah, we should. And then nobody does it. And so, um, you know, you can, you can figure it out yourself, but there's no direct support, uh, at least that I've seen. Um, evolution, again, if you don't have IDL, how can you evolve? You don't even have a contract in the first place. So, or you could say, then I can totally evolve however I want, right? There's no contract. Um, reactive events, perfect for that. Um, broad adoption, pretty good, getting better. Speed, pretty good. You know, you're still HTTP, but pretty good. And then optionality, no specific, you know, relationship there. All right, so, so SSE versus WebSockets, I think we called out the big, the big issues here. SSE is better for almost all situations, I would say. Um, it can be multiplexed over a single connection if you have HTTP2, which is 40% of the traffic on the internet now, so getting there. Um, and WebSocket has that one killer feature, though, which is it can do binary. And it's a little bit lower overhead, too, if you're really, really worried about that. All right, so that's lab four, building an event-driven API with server-side events. Let me see how we're doing here. Okay, yep. So uh, I'm, I'm actually just gonna leave you guys with the labs and we'll, we'll press on, because we're, we're getting close. And what, what we can do is if we have any time at the end, I'll let you guys work on lab stuff. And I'll be happy to help, but again, it's, it's the, the lab's really pretty well put together, pretty tight. I don't think you're gonna have a lot of questions. There's a lot of like, examples and um, everything's you know, kind of spelled out and it's all Docker stuff. So should be pretty straightforward. Okay, so gRPC, our next guy. Um, gRPC defines an IDL, but really actually it's the protocol buffers IDL. And um, protocol buffers gives you the ability to define messages. And so gRPC, they say, you know, you read the documentation, gRPC is an RPC system and it can use any serialization system you like as long as it's protocol buffers in small print, you know. You could, sure, you could maybe use something else. Nobody does, I've never seen it done and I don't know why you'd do it, so it would be just, you know, it's pretty much protocol buffers and, and gRPC. Now what's interesting is protocol buffers is still a Google thing. A um, lot of rumbling about, hey, shouldn't this be given to the CNCF? It's pretty important, you know, and, and all that. But I, I think there's some, some, you know, copyright issues or some licensing, you know, something like that. that. That's at least the, the, the things I hear. But gRPC was donated to the CNCF um, a while back and obviously is used all over the place, but it, it does, in fact, at the moment, depend on protocol buffers. So protocol buffers was all about creating these messages. Because if you've got a message, you have something you can send to a server over any mechanism, right? Over Kafka or NATS or an RPC, you know, request. Here's my function call. And then you get your result back in another message. And under the covers, this is exactly what Apache Thrift does. It, um, it takes the parameters that you list out and just turns them into a struct and sends them over. And then you can return a, a discrete element, but it just puts that in a struct and returns it. So you have the flexibility of returning multiple things, extending and evolving your APIs without breaking um, clients. Notice the optional there, right? If something is required, you've got to return it no matter what, or your API is broken. But most things are listed as optional, specifically so you don't get stuck like that. And if you don't have this, maybe you sunset this feature, you just don't return it anymore, right? Everybody knows it was optional, you have to write code that respects the API contract. So that's a look at the protocol buffer side of it. And then the gRPC side of it um, is where we get support for RPC components. And so over here, um, you can see that we've got, um, a Go program, 
And G, the G, you know, no, they, nobody will admit what the G stands for. You can guess, right? It's, it was invented at Google. But um, it's not Go, right? It's a, it generally was used for all of the, the internal languages at Google. So they had great libraries for C++, Java, Python, and you know, Go and other languages too. If it's a commercially viable language, you can use it with gRPC. And you can see the um, gRPC uh, server being set up here, and then we specify the protocol buffer um, server contract that we're going to implement. We listen on some port, and then everything else is going to get dispatched up here to the um, functions that we attach to that server struct there. So this is um, Go's way of um, you know, kind of creating interfaces uh, on objects. Um, we don't have cl the classical system in Go, but you know, every programming language is different. And that's one of the sort of interesting things about these IDL implementations. If you're using Go, things are going to be kind of Go-like. If you're using Python, things are going to be kind of Python-like. So you, you'll be familiar with it when you go see this IDL in another language, but there'll be some stuff that's different, right? J not JavaScript is pretty different. And so the implementations there can be a, a little bit orthogonal to what you might be used to in a traditional classical language like C++ or Java or something like that. Um, but in any case, that's the gRPC piece of it. So gRPC is basically the RPC runtime that uses protobuf. And so um, with gRPC, you can see this is a pretty knockout uh, lineup here. Um, support for transport data, headers, yeah, polyglot, absolutely, IDL, uh, strong. Evolution, great. Streaming, it, it does have uh, the ability to stream back to the client, which is used everywhere in Kubernetes, right? All, all, all of the um, sort of dependency inversion stuff breaks down when you can't stream data back, right? And so this is what enables it. And so when you have 1,000 kubelets, you don't want the API server connecting to 1,000 kubelets. You want the one kubelet to make its own connection. And if there's 10 of them, great. Then they'd make their 10 connections. If there's 100, then great. They make their 100 connections. But then what happens when the API server needs to say, hey, you got a new pod? And it needs to say it right now. It doesn't want to wait for you to pull your next you know, cycle. Well, you need streaming. And this is exactly what gRPC brings to the table and why it's so important in a lot of API architectures. And queries, again, you know, with RPC, you can always do queries, but it's not particularly good at it. Um, so that is gRPC. And then we got a little lab set up where you build a client and a server and test them out. And all this stuff is, you know, you're running the server and the client and Docker containers, and they talk over the Docker network and all that. It walks you through it. All right. So the last of the, the biggies is GraphQL. And so GraphQL is really interesting, and it's not shocking at all that it came out of Facebook. Um, you know, who else has? this big entire pool of all of these nodes that, that have relationships with each other, right? And that when a message pops up here, you want to propagate it to first order, second order, and so on nodes. Um, well, um, there you have it, right? Facebook comes up with GraphQL. They want to make it possible for applications to get the data that they want. And so what was happening with a lot of our sort of non-queryable APIs where we were building these very robust contracts, even though we made those contracts evolvable, they're still a little bit rigid, right? There's certain things you got to pass, got to get back. And so how about this? You build an interface, and then you have one client that, that is running in a browser on a laptop, and that thing's got, you know, 512 gigs of RAM or whatever it has, it's, it, you can send it all the stuff, right? It has probably a broadband connection. And then you switch to this guy, right? One interface does not rule them all, it turns out. Um, you know, Netflix in their early microservice journey, lots of other companies have had to say, you know what, we have to build um, we have to build a back end for the front end, right? Whatever it is, th these guys need a different level of granularity than the guys that are running on the big, powerful laptops with good connections. So we, we have to do different APIs, or we have to build an API that's flexible that allows you to specify like, how much you're going to get returned or, 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 or so on. But, but there's also just the, the, the real estate, right? In the, in, the, in the phone, you might only want two columns, but on the desktop, you might get all 10. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very complex problem to try to satisfy all these different environments. And when you build a contract up front, what happens when some really inventive person at your company comes with, up with a brand new application that nobody thought of before? 
and, but they're stymied because they can't make it work because the API contracts are so intractable that they can't solve their problem easily. Well, all of a sudden, you have something like GraphQL where you can say, look, I've got a schema. There's a bunch of queries you can make. They're parameterized, and you can literally pick the stuff you want. And in one round trip, you can tell me all of the stuff you want. I'll go and make the 40 back-end calls to the you know, uh, CQRS you know, pool of data that's over here that has five microservices worth of data that I can get from that guy. But then this guy, I got a call directly. And then I have to go and hit some other data store directly my own self, pull all that data back together, and give it to you. That way, the slow bandwidth connection makes one round trip and the fast ones make many. And this is really what, what the magic of GraphQL is. It gives the client the ability to get the data that they want. And when you extend that schema, it doesn't impact anybody else. It's, it's a whole other level of evolution. And it gives people the ability to articulate at a very, very fine grain scale um, the things that they want to receive back. And is it good for um, querying graph databases? <laughs> sure is, as it turns out. But it's also good for just querying anything. If you've got a big pool of microservices, you just exploded your state all over the place, probably. And it's going to be a lot harder to collect it back. And this is a great way to do it. So it gives you a lot of useful um, types of uh, options. And you know, you don't, I, I would say that you don't see a lot of programming uh, solutions for applications that are just GraphQL. Um, but it's possible, but you would probably be doing you know, some tweaking, right? You'd be shoehorning some things into GraphQL that like, yeah, it would probably be easier with gRPC or Thrift or something else. Um, but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's the kind of thing where if you have that one oddball, maybe you stick it in there, right? Um, but if you have a whole bunch of stuff, maybe these things are you know, one, one API scheme and these things are, are GraphQL. And so what does it do well? Well, it, it, it can run over HTTP, and usually does. So it has header support. It's polyglot. Um, I, it has uh, the IDL. But what's the IDL? The schema, right? It's all about, hey, this is the schema, and you can query this schema, and you can get back all sorts of stuff. It's a very different kind of contract. It's a schema-based contract, and it's a lot more flexible in that way. Um, but it is, you know, it's a, it's, there's an interface definition language. It's the GraphQL schema is the way that you define the contract. Um, it's a, evolvable. Um, you can add stuff to the schema, and it doesn't break the old guys. Um, it's got reactive events uh, kind of support. You can stream. So if somebody says, I have a query, and you give them all the stuff, new stuff comes in, you can stream it to them if you want to, which is sort of nice. Um, it has pretty broad adoption. It's decently fast, although there's some, you know, there's some interesting things because they try to provide you with an engine that does a lot of stuff, and then you just build the fetchers that go out and get the data. And so sometimes that can be inefficient, and you, you might need to you know, overhaul some of that and do it a little bit differently to get it to be fast. But, but the big news is that the expensive part now is one round trip. And instead of returning what your contractual gRPC or, or, or REST API is always going to send, you can whittle that down sometimes to you know, 10% of the size of what it used to be. And that right there is the win. Um, so depends, right? And, and optionality, of course, queries. This is the one that's king there, right? You have so much flexibility in just getting the things that you want. So the last thing that I would bring up would be, if I have time, how am I doing? Oh, OK, two minutes. I can do it. Um, so the last thing I would bring up is messaging as an API. Right? Thinking about an, an application programming interface, is, is, it's just that. right? I build my application, and I program to these other systems. And I give them stuff, they give me stuff. And there's a contract there that makes it reliable and repeatable and scalable and all that sort of stuff. Well, if you take Apache Kafka, and I, just, I use it because it's super popular and everybody uses it. Right? It's a way for messages to flow throughout an organization. And it's another great way to allow somebody you never met that you never knew about that got hired five years after you got hired who thought of something amazing that you never would have imagined can just create it because they have the data. If all that data is flowing through your topics, they can invent things that, that nobody else ever thought of and put them to work and create them and make them real without a lot of roadblocks because the data is there. But the data used to always be like, Oh, I got to go talk to this guy to figure out like what's that those two bytes in the middle of that thingy there. I don't, you know, 
Um, now we have schema registry, right? Fairly recent invention in the Kafka space. And you can use protocol buffers or you can use Avro. And so this is Apache Avro. You specify the schema, Avro schema, yet another one, right? Protocol buffers, Thrift, Avro. They all do kind of the same thing, but they're all a little bit different. This is an Avro schema, and it says, hey, this is a user object. It's a record, like a struct, and these are the fields that it's got, and those are the types that they have, and so on. And so you could write some code to serialize and deserialize this stuff pretty easily. Well, Avro's superpower is that you don't need to know the schema in advance to deserialize something. You can literally get the schema out of the schema registry for the topic you're reading from, and then you can use the Avro library and say, hey, here's the schema for this thing, decode it. Normally with protocol buffers or with Apache Thrift, you compile the serializers in advance from the IDL. It does make it a lot faster, that's for sure, and you can compile Avro too if you want to, but it can also dynamically discover these schemas. So you have the ultimate evolution capability, right? You can you know, push new schemas into the schema registry, and when new types of objects start flowing through that topic, you can still decode them. And that's pretty powerful. So that's the idea of the combination of a, a, an a interface contract, Avro, but wiring it to the topics through the schema registry and the distribution mechanism that is Kafka. And so that's about all I can cram into 45 minutes. Um, points for these guys, I'd say you still have headers. Kafka supports headers, right? They didn't. But then they're like, everybody's like, you, you, can't, you can't exist without headers. We need headers. So they added headers. Polyglot, of course, IDL, now with Avro. Uh, evolution, for sure, with Avro. Um, streaming, it is. Uh, support, huge speed. It's very fast and linearly scalable. And you know, you know, OK, it doesn't do, do queries. So another piece of the puzzle, right? And if you go back to that curiously recurring communications pattern, you think about all those different, you know, uh, event horizons, right? There's the internet, there's the stuff you want to do interactively so you can respond immediately, and there's the things you want to decouple and do asynchronously. There's technology here for all of those phases of existence. And Lab 7, again, uh, covers some of that stuff. So, um, yeah, that's a, a quick look, super quick look, at some of the most popular API technologies and how they compare and contrast and what they do, and a take-home lab, I guess, um, that you guys can, can uh, have some fun with. So, yeah, um, I think we're, we're out of time. I, I'm okay if there's any questions. You're welcome to, to holler if you have any. Happy to do a sidebar, too. Yeah? Uh, I don't have a good answer. <laughs> yeah, when would you use WebRTC? Yeah. Yeah? I have a question because traditionally we use REST all over the websites. So, which one would you take for a little bit future development? Because GraphQL is a static tool, and so needs to use REST API for the explorer below that point. Uh, the, the web is moving really fast these days, and I, I don't know that there's an error apparent, and there's a huge amount of inertia. You know, around some of the technologies that you know are are in place already. So, um, I don't, do you guys have any thoughts? What are you looking at? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't have a strong opinion on any you know any next generation heir apparent. There's a lot of neat stuff happening though, and that's for sure. You got to keep your ear to the ground. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody. See you at the aquarium. Yeah.